Rome conquered tribes in the ancient world with relative ease. But one group of people put up a massive fight and were in many ways the bane of Rome. These people were the Iron Age Germanic tribes, who lived in the forests of Central Europe, west of the Rhine and north of the Danube River. The Romans dubbed this land Germania, named after the people who lived here called the Germani. Tacticus wrote in 98 AD that the name Germania was modern and newly introduced. He stated that the term Germani was related to the Tungri tribe, who lived in Gaul, west of the Rhine, but had become an artificial name to refer to the people east of the Rhine also. It's most likely a Celtic word, deriving from Gear or Gearum, meaning neighbours or screamer. Germania consisted of harsh and dark woodlands in Central Europe and freezing tundra in Scandinavia. Its borders were natural and consisted of the Rhine, Danube and Vistula rivers. The Romans believed that this land was entirely filled with forests. However, in reality, forests made up around the average for the time. This just goes to show how unexplored this land really was. To the west lay the Gaul, a Celtic people. To the south, the Latin cultures. And to the east, the steppe people. Germania acted as a sort of borderlands, splitting up these vastly different cultures. But the origins of the Germanic peoples is not a simple one. For a start, the Germanic tribes would not have called themselves Germanic. By the 1st century AD, the writings of Caesar, Tacticus and other Roman era writers indicate a division of Germanic speaking peoples into tribal groupings based on the rivers of Oda and Vistula, what we now call Poland, and these were known as the East Germanic tribes. Scandinavia, minus the Danish islands, were known as the North Germanic tribes. Those around Jutland and the Danish islands, known as the Invigions. Those around the Elbe River, known as the Imanons. And finally, those around the Lower Rhine River, known as the Istrivions. The sons of Manus, Istrivions, Imrions and Istrivions are collectively known as the West Germanic tribes. These different groups all developed their own separate dialects. The basis for the differences among the Germanic languages, even in the present day, they were viewed as barbarians to the Romans, and like the Celts, were ununified. However, they did share similar language, culture, and religious worship. Germania was originally inhabited by the Celts. The early Germanic tribes pushed the Celts west, who became the Gaul. The Celts who remained in Germania became slaves, were subjugated, or simply assimilated. Early Celtic culture had a huge influence on early Germanic culture and they only started to be viewed as different in the first century AD. The ability to push into Celtic territory also shows the supremacy of the Germanic tribes' military abilities in comparison to the Celts. The hierarchy of the Germanic tribes placed the nobility on top, who consisted of family bloodlines. Next were the free men, who consisted of warriors who could bear arms and also raise armies. The servants were on the bottom, who consisted of farmers, fishermen, blacksmiths, and the working class. These differed only slightly from slaves, who were not compensated for their work and instead were owned by either free men or nobility. Conversely, the Germanic tribes were more equal than most. Chiefs and nobility dined with their tribe and most lived in only simple houses. This did change over time as kings grew more powerful, but early on, the Germans lived highly egalitarian societies as essentially everyone was equally poor. They chose their kings and leaders from noble birth and this was very important to the Germanic peoples. But their commanders were chose through valour and experience and the power of the king was not absolute or arbitrary. These free men ruled less through authority and more through setting a good example and the more admiration they inspired, the more men they'd rally around them. There is also a third pillar of leadership, the priests who were the only ones permitted to act as judges for offenders, with chastisement not being done from the military or the crown, but by the gods. Even the nobility were judged by the priests. If you had a problem with the king, you would most likely just be able to walk up and tell him to his face. Kings, although respected, were not legislated or shrouded in pompery. This seals how meritocratic the Germanic society was, and most likely why they grew to such success. Men were dominant in their households and the reputation of everybody in the family lay on the shoulders of men.
All of the men in the family were also expected to pull their weight in either hard labour or a skill, such as boat making, but this was rare. Most men were warriors, and it was considered unmanly to do other work other than fighting. Other work, even important stuff such as tilling the fields, was done by women, old, weak, dumb, blind, disabled, or the slaves. Being a leader and warrior was seen as the same thing to the Germans, with physical prowess being a necessity for being viewed as a real man. Germans instead preferred to take what they wanted through force, and when not raiding or at war, the German warriors were quite lazy, thinking of nothing more than eating and sleeping. This grew into a love for fighting and a hatred for peace. German men were also known to be stoic. Tacticus wrote that a woman may discreetly express her grief, while a man must nurse his own heart. This was unusual for the time. For example, the Latins and Greeks would openly weep, and it was not seen as unmanly. Women were viewed with much respect, but were far from equal. They would have had a huge amount of influence over their husbands and sons, and were also in charge of running family matters. Because of this, some women may be quite powerful, but only in the background. Marriage was something taken very seriously by most Germanic tribes, being monogamous. However, in rare cases, male nobles would take multiple women in order to secure alliances and or have children. Marriage was viewed as an equal alliance between males and females, sharing fortunes of both war and peace. Wives were also highly respected in society, especially in front of her children, and couples were expected to have children. They had a high regard for chastity, and saw having sex before the age of 20 as disrespectful. Adultery was also taken very seriously by the Germans. The husband was able to punish his wife as he saw fit, but the most common punishments were cutting her hair off, stripping her off in front of her relations, expelling her from the house, and pursuing her with a whip throughout the village. An adulterous wife would also have been known as a prostitute. It is unknown what the punishment for male adultery was, but it was likely severe. Giving in to lust or vice was seen negatively by the Germans, quite the opposite of what was going on in Rome and Greece at the time. The Germanics were also not as interested in art as others at the time, and the Romans stated they cared little for agriculture, and instead maintained a diet on milk, cheese and meat. In fact, some Roman historians called the Germanic tribes quite lazy. However, the Germanic tribes did enjoy telling oral stories and passing them on through the generations. These stories would form the basis of their religion, history and legends. The Germanic tribes were also quite democratic. Most tribes would elect their own king, who was chosen from a warrior assembly and could be deposed through election. Kings were expected to lead their people into battle and raids, as well as keeping order and safety in their lands. They also led a more symbolic role to unify the tribe around them, similar to how monarchies still work in the modern day. The German peoples viewed their tribe as their family. Each of these peoples, races, ethnicities or breeds, whichever is most politically correct, had a progenitor ancestor who they are all descendant from. Each of these ancestors were the first kings in a patriarchal fashion. Similar to the Arab tribes, they are all descended from a certain ancestor. And this is what makes them part of the tribe. This is different from today, where we just gain a piece of paper that states you're part of a people. These kings themselves are descendants from legendary figures, such as Woden and Humbli. Thirteen of these progenitor kings are known. Angul, king of the Angles. According to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, the kings of Mercia also claim ancestry from Angle, while other Anglo-Saxon dynasties are derived from other descendants of Woden. However, this may have just been claimed by the kings of Mercia. Other scholars at the time speculated that all of the Angles that migrated into Britain were descendant from Angle. Or Vandal could have been the progenitor of the Vandals, but this is uncertain and only speculated because of the similar naming. Burgundus is known to be the progenitor king of the Burgundians. Cabidius, the king of the Cabidi, Dan, the ancestor of the Danes, and also one of the origins of the common name Daniel, Njor, the progenitor of the Norwegians, Gothus, the first Goth, and he showed up in many Germanic legends, not sure if I'm pronouncing this right, but Ningf, the progenitor of the Naglins, Ermin, king of the Amernions, Lombardius, progenitor of the Lombards, Saxonate, progenitor of the Saxons, According to the Kings of Mercia, apart from them, all other English people are descendant from Saxonate. Valagophus, the progenitor of the Valagoths, and finally Suiones, the King of the Swedes. <laughs>
although his children were originally called the Sevilla. There were many more, but the rest have unfortunately been lost to history. So what did the children of these kings look like? Unlike Celtic, which is more of a culture, Germanic has traceable DNA. It stems from the Yamnia, and I made you a video on them at a future date. Modern Germanic DNA is 90% European and 75% from indigenous German tribes. This is also post-modern mass migration into Germany, but it's likely these percentages were even more homogenous in the past. The past migrations is overly complicated. So to oversimplify it, the earliest Germanic tribes came from the Indo-European peoples, who migrated north into Scandinavia. Some migrated down from Scandinavia and took over Central Europe from the Celtic tribes through either domination or subjugation. These were known as the Jastorf people of Denmark and Saxony and were accepted to be the first Germanic people. Little is known about this Bronze Age culture and peoples, but they did have distinct burial practices from the Halsak cultures, which themselves came part of the Celtic culture and shows how the first split between Germanic and Celtic culture arose. Because of the lack of sunlight in Scandinavia and Northern Europe as a whole, the Germanic people would have had pale white skin that would have easily burnt in hotter climates due to adapting with less menelin. As males trained to be warriors from such a young age and had to work in harsh conditions, they grew very big and muscular. Some tribes did not shave until they had killed another man. Young men with beards therefore were considered untested and green in battle. Different tribes would have had different variations on this. For example, beards and moustaches were considered manly and fashionable by other tribes. Some men would also braid their hair in dreadlocks, and this was not uncommon. A good example of these unique hairstyles is the Swabian knot that would have been worn by men. Hair was a sign of fertility and masculinity to the Germans, who would have spent a long time looking after and grooming their facial and head hair. They used combs and butter to treat their hair. Butter made it stink, but this was less important to how it looked. Having thick, heavy and stylized hair was viewed as attractive to both sexes. They wore little clothing and animal skins, covering only what was necessary according to Roman and Greek historians. However, this was most likely only the Germanic warriors. Archaeology instead suggests they wore sheep wool and plant flax to weave clothing, and they would have worn quite a lot of it. However, this may just have depended on the tribe. The Romans also stated that the men bathed in rivers together. Tacticus even stated that some tribes wore cloaks and nothing else. It does seem, however, that the Germans loved wearing their cloaks, and there wasn't much undergarments found, meaning that maybe only the rich wore them. Julius Caesar described them as tall, brave, and skillful with weapons. Even their gaze is unbearable. Most reference them as having blue or grey eyes, and red or blonde hair. However, as the Germans mixed with other tribes, this would slowly change. This is because they had recessive genes, and the genes of other tribes would over time dominate. This led to over time, more and more Germans having dark hair and eyes, especially those who lived further away from Scandinavia. Another big aspect of the Germanic people was their language. The main theory is that the Germanic languages also trace their origins from the Yamnia, who lived on the eastern steppes around 3300 BC, and is also an Indo-European language. Around 2700 BC they had settled, interbred or displaced other tribes in Europe, possibly with their skill of being able to ride horses. The Amnia languages entering into Europe at this time gave birth to early versions of Greek, Latin and the Germanic languages. During the Bronze Age, around 3300 BC, the Yamnia language had merged with the natives into now what we call the Proto-Germanic languages. This was primarily spread by the Jastorf culture. It is the Germanic language that allowed these people to share a culture and history, as they themselves were not unified. There were three splits in the Proto-Germanic language, known as the West, East and North languages. The first Germanic language split into four, Low Saxon or Low German, with around 7 million speakers, and a further three categories, Anglo-Frisians, Low Frankians, and High Germans. The Anglo-Frisian category split into two, Frisian with half a million speakers, and Old English, which is extinct. Instead, Old English split more into English with over 400 million speakers, and Scots 
with 1.5 million speakers. Low Francian split into Dutch with 24 million speakers and Lumbergish with 1.3 million speakers. Dutch itself split further into Afrikaans with 7.2 million speakers. The High German category consists mostly of the 100 million German speakers. However, it did split further into 0.4 million Luxembourgerish speakers and 1.5 million Yiddish speakers. The North Germanic languages split into two subcategories, East Scandinavian and West Scandinavian. The West Scandinavian languages are Danish with 5.5 million speakers and Swedish with 11.1 million speakers. The East Scandinavian languages consist of Norwegian with 5.3 million followers, Icelandic with 0.3 million followers and Farosi with only 0.7 million speakers being the closest to extinction in the modern day. And finally we have the East Germanic languages which consists of Gothic which is also extinct. The third most popular Germanic language is Dutch. The second most popular Germanic language is German and the most popular Germanic language spoke worldwide is English by a huge margin. There are approximately 515 million Germanic speakers worldwide. However, this and all of the other numbers just mentioned are only estimates. All of these numbers were also based on native speakers, so it's likely that even more people speak English and German. The Germanic language also has a very cool way of giving names. They sometimes merge two words together. For example, the common name Signe combines the words Signe meaning victory and I think it's pronounced Neue meaning new. Therefore the name Signe means victory new or new victory. Another example of this is the name Harjewalders which combines the word Harjes meaning army and Walders meaning leader. Therefore Harjewalders translates to army leader. This name is also a great example on how the traditional Germanic names have been modernized over time as this name over time became Haraldur and then Haralda and it is still in use today with the more modern version Harald. Early Germanic culture was rural. They lived in small to mid-sized villages and revolved around the rearing of animals such as goats and cattle with only a few expanding into the farming of grain. Before the third century all of the Germanic peoples lived a harsh life. There was little excess of anything and they had to live day to day with no material wealth. Villages were spread across northern central Europe and Scandinavia. However, none of these villages would have had more than 200 people living in them, with many slaves and clans living within. They lived in long houses made from wood, clay or turf, with the roofs stretching to the floor because of the snow. These houses could have also acted as a barn for animals during the night time, but the day-to-day -day activities of the family would have also taken place in here. All of the houses were long, but some longer than others. The length of one's house would have been the greatest way to show your power and wealth. However, calling these things houses would be a stretch. They were not built well, and Tatticus stated that they didn't even make use of stones or wall tiles. For all purposes, they employ wrought hewn timber, ugly and unattractive looking. And it is true that other tribes around the time, even their neighbours, the Celts, built houses that have lasted even to this day. However, according to Caesar, this was because many of the tribes were nomadic and only had simple and temporary houses to protect from the weather. He also suggested that the buildings could have been purposely very simple to avoid getting raided by other Germanic tribes. The population of these villages would have grew over time with the rearing of animals, mainly cattle. They would have eaten grain with vegetables with a focus on dairy, with meat being more of a treat being eaten about once a week. However, the Germans made up of this lack of farming with the brewing of beer. The Romans viewed the Germans as a bunch of drunkards. However, to the Germans, the drinking of beer, hosting of beer, and to be able to hold one's beer was a sign of manliness. Germanic culture helped beer become a commonly drunk item and a communal activity over other drinks such as Latin wine. This culture spread can be easily seen today by those areas where the pub or tavern is still the heart of their communities or by the more obvious celebration of Oktoberfest. The Germans also place a huge emphasis on feasting and the entertainment of guests. It was even viewed as a sin to turn away a guest from your door 
This was not uncommon for the ancient world, but the Germans mixed this much more with the drinking of beer. Men would hash out arguments loudly while drunk in taverns, before calmly coming to a conclusion once they'd sobered up. Tacticus stated that the Germans were not cunning or sophisticated enough to refrain from blundering out their innermost thoughts in the freedom of festive surroundings. This is just another way of saying that they were unreframed and very down to earth. This mentality was quite different to the Latin and Greek one, where socialization was surrounded in etiquette, politics and skullduggery. The Germanic tribes viewed themselves as pure and as a group of themselves. They weren't fond of breeding with foreign people or even mixing with them in the early days. This was very different to the Latins and Celts, who were much more multiracial, although not as much as modern activists like to suggest. Tacticus claimed that although kingship was passed down through bloodlines, it was the various war leaders that held the real power. However, these war leaders only remained in power if they kept winning great victories for their tribe, which led to a high-performing military meritocracy that made the Germanic peoples deadly and competent fighters. Additionally, each village or area had the concept of the 100. These 100 made up a special army that could be mobilized in an instant and brought with it much social clout. To be one of the 100 meant you were one of the best fighters. This again shows how meritocratic this society was, as it was your duty to the village to defend it. Moreover, the chiefs or king's personal bodyguards were expected to die alongside them. If the chief fell in battle, his bodyguards would also fight to the death. The chief himself was expected to fight in battle, and it was seen as a disgrace to be surpassed in courage by their followers. Therefore, the chief had to keep pushing himself to be better than his troops. The chief fought for victory, while his followers fought for their chief. The Germanic tribes used to war against one another and raid each other constantly. Although never unified, they did form various sizes of federations. This political landscape was ever-changing and has therefore been lost to history. But what we do know is that the rise or fall of these federations led to a militant Germanic culture. War and raiding was seen as a necessity for survival, with the looting of food, women, slaves and weapons commonplace. However, over time it also warped into a way of gaining power and prestige. The punishment for crime was severe and often resulted in death. Some punishments were meant to be seen by the tribe as a warning. These criminals were hung from trees on full display, traitors and deserters. However, some crimes were punished out of sight as not to spread the ideas or to hide the shame. These criminals were plunged into the marshes with something strapped to their heads. Such crimes were cowardice, being a poor fighter, dastards, and sodomy or unnatural practices. Most Germanic kings didn't recruit warriors as they were limited on a social basis. Instead, warriors were incented to fight in exchange for prestige, wealth, or just a sense of duty. The Germanic warriors were known for having tough inventory, but were not known for having high quality metal. This was again reserved for the elites. Instead, the common infantry fighter wore linen or leather and wore nothing above their waist. It was mainly the leaders who wore armour. This would have been simple chainmail or on rare occasions, scale armour. Helmets were also limited in early Germanic armies, most likely so that the warrior could be more easily seen in battle and maybe show off their fancy hair. Helmets did become more common over time, but these did not have horns like some suggest. Instead, they wielded javelins and short spears called fremia. As iron was hard to come by, these fremia were considerably lesser than the counterparts of the time. They also carried long oval, rectangular or circular wooden shields that had iron on them for greater bashing ability. Tribal symbols would have been painted on these shields, most likely their clan or possibly a family symbol. The bashing ability of the shield came from their shield bosses, which were often spiked to double as an offensive weapon. These Germanic warriors also utilised the shield wall, which may have been adopted from the Roman scutum. However, this could have developed independently. Even for the time, they were woefully equipped. However, Tacticus spoke boldly of their courage and brutal warfare. The Germanic people viewed cowardice as probably the worst of all traits and bravery as the most virtuous. The heavy infantry would have utilised a variety of weapons passed down through the family and tribe. Most notably were axes, spears, javelins, slings, bows, axes, 
and even wooden and bone clubs. In fact, the Germans had very little metal, even as late as the first century. However, in later periods, all Germanic tribes seemed to love small circular shields that they would paint. This shield would have been given to them at the age of 16 by their king, a noble, or even their father. They would also utilize guerrilla tactics against their foes, mostly due to their inferior equipment and numbers. Their dark woodland home made ambushes a constant threat to any invader into German land. There are accounts of some tribes painting their weapons and bodies black with charcoal dye, aiding camouflage. The Harai tribe, for example, used black shields and painted their bodies, and attacked at night as a shadowy army, much to the terror of their opponents. Theories have been proposed connecting the Harai to the Inheria, ghostly warriors in service to the god Odin. These were attested to much later by the North Germanic peoples by way of Norse mythology and the tradition of the wild hunt, a procession of the dead through the winter night sky sometimes led by Odin himself. Unlike other tribes around them, distinctly the Celts to their west, the early Germanic tribes made very little use of cavalry. Instead horses were reserved as a symbol of power and luxury to the elite. As Romanization spread into Germania however, the Germanic peoples would become very adept horsemen. In fact, before Romanization, Germanic infantry moved toe-to-toe -to -toe with horses, suggesting they were pulled or just trotted them into battle. Maybe the Germans saw the horse as more of a status symbol, saw the height advantage of being on a horse being enough for battle, or just the concept of a cavalry charge had not occurred to them as they were more of a skirmish and guerrilla tactic people. Freemen were trained to be warriors at a young age by their uncles and fathers, and by the age of 16 they were expected to do battle. Germans also viewed battle as a spectacle. Women and children would sometimes accompany the men to battle and cheer them on from the sidelines. Although this was not uncommon for other tribes and times, even the Celts, there were more references to the Germans doing this. The women and children normally travelled in wagons and egged their men on like cheerleaders. This would have been great for morale, but also made the consequences for losing dire. These men were quite literally fighting for not only their own lives, but the lives of their women and children who were close by. If a German army was failing, then the women would be forced to fight for their own lives. And you know what they say happens when a mother is forced to protect her children. These German women would rush into a losing battle bare-breasted, rallying their husbands and sons to keep fighting. The men were quite comically shamed into fighting when they didn't want to by their women. The women were also forced to pick up weapons and fight alongside the men on some occasions. Shield maidens were often mentioned in Germanic sagas and sometimes took upon mythical powers. However, shield maidens were not mythical and were just women who fought with shields. It's unknown how much truth there are in these stories and we don't even know for sure if the shield maiden really existed. Although archaeological evidence has been found, it's unknown if these women were real shield maidens, or just buried with weapons as a symbolic gesture, or just buried alongside their warrior husbands. If shield maidens were real, and women were expected to fight, this was unlike most other tribes and civilizations of the time. Warriors would sometimes wear animal skins into battle, mostly boars, bears, and wolves. They believed these skins would grant them the strength of the animal in battle. It is speculated that the warriors would sometimes even roar, growl and snort in battle, taking on the mannerisms of the animal, possibly aided by drugs or just cultural delusion. The berserkers were a highly referenced type of warrior that certainly did exist and they struck much fear into the Romans. They would rush into battle mad and sometimes naked apart from their animal skins, slashing like animals at anything around them. It's unknown how much drugs aided on this behaviour However, psychedelics were certainly used by the Germanic tribes for ritual purposes. The Romans often dismissed the Germans as being undisciplined in battle and acting more like a large mob. However, over time, the Romans would grow more respect for the wild and unbrindled way the Germans fought, as this was the complete opposite way the Romans fought. The Romans would consider the Germanic tribes to be their greatest military opponents. This coming from Rome, the most powerful military civilization of all time, says a lot of how brutal and competent the Germanic warriors must have been. Swords were used much less and viewed as magical items, with many of them being covered in runic writing. They were also captured in battle and sacrificed to the gods 
often by being broken in half and thrown into bogs. The Germans used the bones of their ancestors and of animals to melt into their swords, as they believed this would give the sword more magical power. And during and prior to the Iron Age, this was actually true. You see, bones contain carbon, and combining bones with iron was carbonizing it, creating a rudimentary form of steel. This steel was not good quality by today's standards. However, it was much better quality than the other iron swords of the time. Although a militant culture, there was also room for diplomacy. For instance, there were great inter-tribal gatherings known as hustings. They took place when the moon was neither new nor full, and the attendants would speak in order of rank and importance. A person's prestige and right to speak was determined by battles won, birthright, age, and overall power. The Hustons was very much like the current House of Commons in the UK. The crowds would groan if they disapproved, and bash their shields if they liked what they were hearing. New federations, alliances and disputes of all manner were negotiated without any blood loss. Pagan priests also attended to keep the peace and had the authority to force compliance. Hustin solved not only inter-tribal disputes but also domestic tribal governance. Only chiefs and kings debated minor matters, but everybody debated matters that affected the tribe as a whole. Although restless and disorganised, this isn't necessarily a bad thing for the democratic process as being over-bureaucratic, for instance the debates happening in Rome, could stifle voices. Their religion is now known as Germanic Paganism. They believed that spirits and magic were all around them, and the gods were dominant. They would be considered completely crazy by today's standards. However, this was not a uniform religion, and their practices and beliefs varied from settlement to settlement. It revolved around nature worship, but also encompassed strength and survival. Much like Celtic paganism, the religious worshipping of the Germanic tribes is hard to research. We again know that they used groves and forests as their temples, but now know the given reason. They thought that containing their gods in man-made structures was unworthy. There were also many standing stones, more in Scandinavia than in the south, but it seems that the Celts and the Germanic tribes were quite similar in many ways. It was a polytheistic religion, having many gods, some long forgotten. But these gods were not human looking. Instead, they took on the shape of nature, mostly trees or animals. Sadly, these trees they worshipped were destroyed by later Christians or simply forgotten. But it reminds me of how the Navi and Avatar viewed their god tree. They also believed in the concept of a world tree. This is well known in later Norse paganism. However, it may have originated much earlier on. Also known as the Tree of Life, this tree connects the spiritual worlds and the mortal world together. Known as Yggdrasil in Norse paganism, the gods used to hold their own hustings here, and its branches used to reach far off into the heavens. They worshipped Woden the most, and in some cases even sacrificed humans to him. Dona was also a common favourite, who they connected with animal life. The Germanic deities also changed names throughout the generations, and as the peoples migrated further to the north into Scandinavia. For example, Woden became Odin, and Dona became Thor, but these were still very much the same gods. Similar to their language, over time the Germanic pantheon split depending on the region. This just shows how disconnected these peoples were, and how the cultures shifted over time. Human sacrifice and ritual slaughter were permitted. Known as blots, these festivals were blood sacrifices dedicated to certain gods and were most seen in Norse paganism and Anglo-Saxon paganism. Germanic priests would read divinations from runes, flight patterns of birds and the behaviour of sacred white horses that were never ridden by humans. I may do another video on Germanic paganism However, pagan priests and seeresses are a necessity to understanding Germanic culture. These religious leaders acted as healers, fortune tellers, midwives, and could talk to many Germanic gods. The seeress was a female Germanic priest who could see into the future. They performed a variety of rituals to do this, such as reading runes, blood trails, bones, feathers, and even poo. Women would rise high in Germanic paganism 
and would wield much power, acting sort of like politicians and diplomats. A long-standing form of this paganism are Germanic runes and the runic alphabet. Notice how the letters here are made from straight lines, as to be easily carved into wood or bone. Not everything around these letters were religious, however. They were also just used as writing. For example, combs have been found with the owner's or maker's names carved into them. Another recurring motif was the wild hunt, where spirits and gods would go on a hunt in our mortal world and would kill everything they came across. These hunts were often led by Odin, who had his own ghostly warrior crew. The wild hunt shows how embedded hunting and being a warrior was, even in their religion. It also shows how prevalent and important storytelling was, as the concept of the wild hunt lasted even after Christianization. Even the afterlife revolved around warrior deeds, meritocracy and duty, as proven by Valhalla. Valhalla was a heaven where those who died honourably in combat fought along with other legendary Germanic heroes and kings as a form of army training until Ragnarok, when they would all march out together to fight in aid of Odin. These many Germanic beliefs lay the foundation for what we know today as European and British folklore. For example, elves and dwarves would also make their appearance through Germanic paganism, and would be wildly popularised through the works of Tolkien. For centuries the Celts acted as a buffer region between Rome and Germania. However, by 118 BC, the Gaul had been beaten back by Rome, leading to the Romans expanding north. Meanwhile, around 120 BC, climate change led to two Germanic tribes in Scandinavia, the Teutons and Cimbri, being forced further south in a mass migration through Germania. It is here that the Latin and Germanic cultures would clash for the first time, and led to what is known as the Cimbrian War. The Cimbri started to attack and displace the Celtic Taruski tribe, who were allied to Rome and asked for help. Rome came to their aid, drawing the Cimbri a map of how to remove themselves, which the Cimbri accepted. However, Rome deceived the Cimbri, with this map setting up an ambush. The Cimbri, however, realising this trap, attacked the Romans head-on, killing over 20,000 Roman soldiers. However, instead of the Cimbri pressing on their advantage and moving on into Italy, they travelled west into Gaul for an unknown reason. Little is known about their time here, however they made both friend and rival with many Celtic Gauls in this area. Rome had little interest in the Cumbri, as they had their own problems further down south in the Jugophine War, and their greatest commander, Gaius Marius, was preoccupied down in Africa. When the Cumbri finally did make their way into Italy, they asked to settle Gallia Narborymphis, and in return, they offered to protect the Roman border for them. However, Rome refused, and in return got another good thrashing from the Cimbri. After another two humiliating Roman defeats, the Cimbri again failed to press on into Italy, and instead decided to raid North Iberia. After the Jugophine War in 106 BC, Gaius Marius returned to Rome to reform the Roman army, learning much from this war. By 102 BC, Marius was ready to face the Cimbri, who were having difficulties in Spain, and were now back in Gaul where they were joined by the Teutons. And this Germanic coalition was determined to press into the south of Italy. But by the time the Germanic tribes turned their attention to Italy, the Roman army had been reformed into a much greater force. Both the Roman and Germanic armies were split. Gaius Marinus defended Mauritia to the west, while another Roman army was stationed in the Alps to the north. The Teutons attacked Gaius Marinus, while the Cimbri attacked through the Alps. Gaius Marinus managed to hold his well-fortified camp against the German Teutons before swiftly beating them again in a field battle, despite being outnumbered two to one. More than 50,000 Germans were killed, while the Romans lost only a few thousand. Meanwhile, the Cimbri pushed the Romans out and managed to travel through the Alps.
This enabled the Kimri to loot and pillage the rich Italian lands in the north. By 101 BC, Gaius Marinus regrouped with the other Roman army and pressed the Cumbri. And the Kimbri didn't want this battle. They had been travelling now for more than a year from Spain and were exhausted from the winter. Instead of fighting, Gaius Marinus had to keep pursuing the Kimbri throughout northern Italy. He was only able to force them into a battle in July. Rome had 50,000 legionaries, while the Germans were numbered in the 60 to 80,000. The Romans had much superior cavalry and managed to use this to their advantage, flanking the Germans and killing or enslaving all of the Cimbri forces, and thus also ending the Cimbrian War. But Rome and Germania would continue to clash. In 60 BC, a Germanic leader known as Ariovistus of the Swaby tribe would travel into Celtic territory and become jealous of their land. Although allies, Ariovistus decided to turn on his ally and take the land. This land was across the River Rhine, so Rome was not happy about this. But it was not only Ariovistus who wanted this land, so did Rome. And at this time, Gaius Julius Caesar was becoming very ambitious. The pair met in 58 BC, and at this point Ariovistus was considered a friend of Rome, so Caesar didn't attack. Caesar sent a message to the Swaby tribe, asking them to return all Celtic hostages and to stop the hostilities in the area. And if they did this, Rome would allow them to settle across the Rhine and still consider them allies. Ariovistus, however, declined this concession from Rome, stating that if Rome could conquer when and where they liked, so could he. At this time, the Germans began to raid Celtic territory, ramping up hostility. Caesar now had provocation to attack, and did. Both Caesar and Ariovistus understood the importance of Vesanito, a town in modern-day France, and rushed to set up a defensive position. The Romans got there first and rested. However, upon hearing of the size of the Swaby force, the Romans began to panic. Many of the officers held their posts for political reasons, and had no real war experience, and Caesar was at risk of mutiny. Caesar remained in control by stating that he would face Ariovistus with only his 10th legion, if no one else would follow. This shamed the other officers into following Caesar, and they marched onwards. Ariovistus set up for another meeting with Caesar, and they rode out with only cavalry. But this meeting went poorly. There was even a slight scuffle between the cavalry before both generals returned. Ariovistus sent out for another meeting a couple days later. Since in a trap, Caesar instead sent out his translators, who were then captured. The Swaby then sunk behind the Romans, cutting them off from their supply lines and holding upon a hill. They then started setting up battle formations. There were 15,000 Swaby and 25 to 30,000 Romans. Ariovistus didn't fight head on. Instead, the start of the battle consisted of mostly cavalry skirmishes, while Ariovistus held the hill, cutting the Romans off from their supplies. The Swaby cavalry were unique in respect that lightly armoured infantry accompanied those on horseback, running as fast as they could. An odd tactic, but it seems to have worked as the Roman cavalry came off worse. The Romans therefore formed into three lines. The two front lines would march just out of range of the Swaby force, while the back set up a new camp on an opposite side of the hill, reconnecting the Roman supply lines. The Swaby marched their cavalry and light infantry to harass the Romans, but failed to hold them off. Now that this new camp was set up and their supply lines reconnected, Caesar and his main force marched up to the main camp. Ariovistus took advantage of this and attacked the new camp. However, the Romans held the Swaby off once more. Caesar was then informed by some hostages that the reason Ariovistus was not committing his whole force is that he was told not to until the new moon by his priests. Hence why the Romans were able to even set up their new camp. Learning of this, Caesar then decided to go on the offensive, 
leaving only small garrisons in the camps. The six Roman legions formed into a triplex axis formation, with his cavalry at the rear. Caesar noticed that the right of the Swaby force was stronger, so stationed himself on the left. Upon Caesar ordering a charge, so did the Swaby force, who took the Romans by surprise, and they even had to drop their javelins without throwing them, allowing for the Germans to set up a shield wall. The Germans met them head on, with their women and children in wagons behind them, egging the men on as cheerleaders. This would have been great for morale, but made the consequences of losing dire. These men were quite literally fighting for not only their own lives, but the lives of their women and children who were close by. Caesar had managed to outmaneuver the Germans on their left, but the Germans had managed to push the Romans back on the right. Therefore Caesar ordered his cavalry to back up the right flank, fixing this weakness. Caesar's left flank now managed to push the Swaby, whose forces broke and ran. It's unknown how many died, but as the Germans could not easily squeeze through the space of their wagons, it is said that it was so packed tightly that the dead couldn't even fall. Those Germans who were lucky enough to squeeze through this space fled back across the Rhine. The Romans would continue to conquer into Gaul, and now the Roman border lay east of the Rhine. Germania now had new neighbours, the most powerful empire of the time. From henceforth, the Rhine and Danube rivers would act as a frontier between Rome and Germania. Many skirmishes took place here, but as the Germanic tribes were ununified, Rome came on top more often. In 16 BC, Rome started their invasions into Germania, but the Germanic tribes never gave up an inch of land without a fight. By 8 BC, West Germania had been turned into an obedient province of Rome. The Roman Empire displaced many of the Germans to better control the area, moving more troublesome people and tribes to areas where they could keep a better eye on them. Tiberius was the main Roman commander in the Roman advance, but was called away to deal with Bel and Betulinum, a revolt further down south in the empire. Varus took his place. He was a very good administrator, but lacked any real military experience. He became governor of Roman Germania in 7 AD. By his side was Arminius, a German prince and Roman ally who gained much military education and even Roman citizenship. He would have helped Varus learn local customs to ease his rule. However, not all was well. Roman troops in Roman Germania were becoming under attack and Varus had trouble tracking them down. A large revolt had erupted in the west, so Varus mobilized his troops to put them down. Meanwhile, Arminius travelled to Germania to gather auxiliary support. Varus travelled through Germania with the aid of Arminius' guides, who led Varus through dense forests to avoid detection. The Romans were slowed and stretched out by the dense forest, and Varus was unfamiliar with the land. All of a the sudden, they were attacked. Germanic arrows, spears and rocks pummeled the Romans from all directions in an ambush, and the Germans dealt much damage before retreating back into the dense forest. To make things worse, Varus had lost Armenius' guides who had fled in the battle. Wet, stuck in the mud, and leaving their sick behind, the Romans travelled west, hoping just to get out of this forest. Tired and muddy, they were ambushed again, but they did manage to survive with heavy losses, now realising they were caught in a trap. Command structure had now broken down, but they kept marching. Varus felt duty-bound to put down this rebellion in the west. They marched for five days, getting into many ambushes with hidden guerrilla Germanic warriors. Varus's main tactic was to simply hide behind makeshift encampments with walls that the army carried around with them. Luckily, they came to a road and an opening. Realising their situation, Varus ordered his cavalry to call for help. But as they rode off, they were ambushed and slain. Varus and many of the other Roman officers, now knowing that all hope was lost, committed suicide. The rest of the Romans were later cut down by the Germans, led by Arminius, who had betrayed the Roman Empire, and there was, in fact, no rebellion in the West. Arminius likely did this either out of the disliking of the treatment of his own people, 
or simply out of wanting to rule his own tribe without Roman influence. Arminius cut off the head of Varus and sent it to another Germanic leader whom Arminius wanted to coax an alliance with. However, this other Germanic leader declined and instead the head was sent back to Rome. The Romans were not skilled or prepared enough for this type of guerrilla warfare. They viewed it as cowardly and with disdain, preferring to fight in an open field or in a real battle. Roman Germania lasted 15 years until Arminius butchered or enslaved the majority of a Roman force. Many Roman generals were sacrificed to Germanic pagan gods and Roman warriors were killed in barbaric ways such as beheading, crucifixion or burned alive. The Germans destroyed all of the Roman settlements in Germania but were still held out of Gaul by the Roman fortifications. Once the common Roman threat was taken care of the Germanic tribes went back to being rivals. Many consider the Battle of Teutonberg Forest to be the worst Roman military disaster in history. From this point onwards the Romans would no longer consider Germania to be possible for future expansion, but as enemy territory. Shortly after the battle, Rome would withdraw from Germania completely and give up trying to subdue it. Armenia set up diplomacy with the Roman Empire, allowing for Germanic culture to thrive. However, the Germanic tribes being ununified again allowed for Rome to influence them over time diplomatically encouraging the tribes to attack and infight instead of attacking the Roman Empire. Between the 1st and 3rd centuries, trade between Rome and Germania boomed. The Romans gave pottery, artefacts and cutlery, while the Germans traded fur, amber and slaves captured from other Germanic tribes. Gold was also found during this period from archaeological digs. However, the Germans had no way of mining this, so it must have been imported. This goes to show how poorly the trade was documented, however it's likely their biggest export was amber and slaves. Runic writing was still used amongst the Germanic peoples, which is quite odd. Rome stopped using their own scripts upon Roman influence and instead took on the Latin alphabet by the 1st century. The fact that runic writing carried on shows us it was an important aspect to Germanic culture despite the significant influence of Rome. Although Germanic culture thrived, writing was still something they lacked and instead they carried on with an oral culture, leading to poetry and legends to thrive. The history we know from the Germans, from their own point of view, comes from these stories. And sadly, they are most likely warped and exaggerated over time. Barley, oats and wheat became much more fun by the Germans, although it was still lacking compared to other civilizations of the time. Animal husbandry, however, was something they adopted a little better, mostly the raising of cattle. Rudimentary smithies, clay and metalwork also began to pop up in villages. Germanic smelting furnaces could have produced metal that was as high quality as the Romans in theory. Metal Roman coins, artefacts, vessels and statues were imported by the Germans, but only to be melted down. This is how people speculate that they have higher quality metal without having the ability to mine it themselves. Tribes could have also earned money for the village in later years through mercenary work. Clothing and textiles were now also produced. These clothes were bold in colours, with women wearing long dresses without sleeves and a belt to make them look more slender. Men wore trousers and were instrumental to them taking off in Western cultures. More male clothing has also been found than female, suggesting that they were better made, made more of it, or women simply wore less than men. Leather shoes, belts and other gear has been found but it's unknown how common it was. Both sexes still wore their cloaks, until Roman style tunics took off in the 5th century. After the disaster in Teutonberg Forest, the Romans reinforced the Rhine border. Germanicus, an Italian, the heir and adopted son of the Emperor Tiberius was placed to guard this border. Germanicus had already proven himself as a great commander and in the past was trusted to counter the Germanic tribes. He was popular among the Roman people, both politicians and warriors. He was even able to recruit his own army from scratch out of loyalty and using his charisma. However, for these very reasons, Emperor Tiberius saw Germanicus as a threat. This was most likely why Germanicus was moved to Gaul in the first place. Upon a revolt of Tiberius's men and the possibility of Germanicus becoming emperor himself, he refused. 
stating that he would rather die than betray the emperor, and then threatening to commit suicide. Germanicus instead set his gaze upon the Germanic tribes and Germania as a whole. Raiding the Marsi tribe in 15 AD and successfully holding against the Germanic tribes counterattacks. This relaxed Roman feeling towards Germania again, rebuilding their confidence. Germanicus led the second Germanic tribes campaign only two years later against the Chatai tribe, who were seen as a future threat to Rome. Sacking the Chatai capital, many villages and slaughtering most of the men. Other nearby Germanic tribes grouped together and attempted to counterattack Germanicus once again. This time led by a familiar face, Armenius. But they were largely unsuccessful, although they did force the Romans to fall back. Germanicus the following year decided to lead the third Germanic tribes campaign, and this time he wanted it to be a decisive one, and was once again confronted by Armenius. Germanicus used the river to navigate his way to Armenius' forces. The two armies stood either side of the Weza River, but he was reluctant to risk his whole army wading through the river. But then he realised that all of Armenius' forces were infantry. So Germanicus charged all of his cavalry in both flanks and the centre. The cavalry did a great job, pushing the line back to Armenius himself. Germanicus could use this as a distraction to get his forces across the river. However, Armenius had once again tricked the Romans. Out of nowhere, his own Germanic cavalry charged, wiping out a large part of the Roman cavalry before Germanicus retreated. The two armies would again meet shortly after on the plains of Edovisto in 16 AD, where Armenius charged all of his infantry at the Romans. The Germans were roundly defeated and slaughtered by the superior Roman army, however Armenius managed to escape. However now Germanicus was deep in Germanic woodland. Here he built a victory trophy from a pile of weapons. This angered Armenius, who was able to rally his troops to regroup and hold the line. The Germans therefore built the Angravarian Wall and wanted to lure the Roman forces in before leading a counter-attack with a secret group of ambushers hidden in the flank. However, Germanicus' scouts had seen the war and he formed his own plan. Germanicus' scouts were also able to spot Armenius' secret army hidden, ready to flank them, and the German tribe led by Armenius was able to fully construct their war. Germanicus decided to take the bait and started by sending part of his inventory to the left side of the wall. Armenius countered this by reinforcing the left flank and successfully pushed the Romans back. While all of this was happening, Germanicus ordered for his cavalry to charge at the secret ambushers hiding in a nearby forest. The Romans then marched in range of the wall and opened fire with arrows, slings and rocks. After seeing a weakness in the Germanic forces, Germanicus charged, ripping through the wall. He then looped around to support his cavalry in the forest. After hours of fighting, the Romans took the wall, and the Germanic leaders fled. The psychological wound of Teutonberg Forest had healed, and although the Emperor Tiberius decided that the conquest of Germania was not worth it, Germanicus was able to return to Rome with more respect and honour than ever. Germanicus was later sent to Asia where he leaves the history books, although some antiquarians suggest that he was poisoned. Armenius would never fully recover. He ended up battling against many other Germanic tribes before being betrayed and slain by his own tribe. Over time the Germanic tribes had been sending bigger and bigger raids into Roman territory, and while past raids had been easily rebuttaled, they were getting more difficult to handle. 
Around 167 AD, a force of 6,000 warriors from the Swaby and Vandalic tribes marked the start of these raids becoming larger and more challenging than ever. Rome therefore negotiated a treaty with the 11 most threatening Germanic tribes, however shortly after, the tribes simply ignored this treaty. Rome was fairly annoyed by this, but due to a plague they had to postpone their response until 168 AD. Where the Romans travelled across the Alps, and there were many battles with the German forces known as the Marcomannic Wars. However, the first expedition was inconclusive. By 170 AD, the Germanic tribes had together formed a capable army and marched into Roman territory, today known as Austria. Here, in the Battle of Caradum, the Romans were outmatched due to the lack of military experience, with 20,000 Roman losses. This defeat led to Italy being wide open, and the German forces started the siege of Aquileia. This was the first time that enemy warriors had been able to enter into Italy since the Cimbrian Wars. This diorama shows the siege of Aquileia by the Marcomanni, a confederation of German tribes. The Romans sally from the gate in an attempt to destroy the siege tower assaulting the wall. But by the winter of 171, the Germanic force had been kicked out of Italy. However, this occurrence shocked the Romans, who now had a greater appreciation of the Germans' military power, if they were to unite. The Romans made peace treaties with select Germanic tribes, before retaliating by attacking the Marcomanni tribe territory in 172 AD, who were the leaders of the German coalition. The second Roman expedition was a huge success. The Marcomanni tribe were subjugated under Rome, and their other enemies came off even worse. However, the Romans had trouble trusting the Germanic tribes who they had peace treaties with, or were supposed to be their allies, and these tribes proved the Romans correct by acting dishonourably and attacking Rome. On one notable occasion, the Roman army would have been forced to surrender due to dehydration, if not for the rain. The Romans were thankful to the gods for this event, dubbing it the Miracle of Rain. Not only did it help supply the troops, but lightning had even struck German forces. The Miracle of Rain event was even minted into Roman coins. It would also mark the end of the First Marcomannic War. Two more Marcomannic Wars would happen shortly after, however they were much less eventful, and the Romans countered the Germanic tribes much easier, slightly growing their territory. These wars were important, as they made the Romans realise how dangerous the Germanic tribes could be if they were allowed to form large confederations but also how weak their defences were, and to counter this, they stationed more troops along the border of Germania. From 375 to 586 AD, climate change, the Huns, famine and overpopulation, led to what is known as the Migration Period. In the next video, we'll be exploring these seven main Germanic migrations. But until then, I hope you enjoyed this video and the references are all in the description.